I decree this is the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to this week's Future Trends Forum. I'm really glad to see you all here. I'm really excited about this week's topic and especially this week's guest. But before I introduce her, uh, let's talk about the forum, where it comes from, what it does, what it hopes to accomplish, and then we'll introduce the topic and our guest. Uh, to begin with, the Future Trends Forum is a conversation-based venue where we explore the future of higher education. We started five years ago, and we've been working every week since. We have a whole battery of nearly 240 recordings on YouTube, if you'd like to look into it. One of the great things about the forum, I think, is that the population here, both in terms of guests as well as all of you, is so diverse in many, many ways. Uh, not only are we diverse demographically, but also geographically in terms of our institutional positions. You'll see university presidents, college students, IT people, faculty, government folks, nonprofit, startup funders, journalists, all kinds of folks, basically anybody who is interested and plays some role in or adjacent to higher education can be here. Now, a couple of background notes. Uh, first of all, obviously we are still in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, some nations are being hit harder than others, notably those in the European Union, as well as Great Britain, Brazil, and the United States. And this has impacted higher education as we've been exploring for a year. And that will come up definitely during our hour today. We're also in the United States and some other countries also involved in a rethinking and reckoning about race and racism. And that too will come up in this week's session. Now, looking ahead a little bit, uh, we have some sessions coming up for the next two months. And I'd like to just touch on these for you a little. Uh, we have a session on reinventing the liberal arts college. We get to meet a rising educational technology star. We have a session on supporting equity on campus, and we have our five-year anniversary coming up at last. If you'd like to learn more about the sessions or if you'd like to sign up for them, just go to tinyurl.com slash forum2021. Now, I want to thank our sponsors before we go a little bit further. Uh, one of them I'd like to thank is NizerNet from New York State. Uh, that's a terrific nonprofit that helps that state's colleges and universities get online with fast broadband and do great professional work together. We love their work and we're grateful to them for their support. We're also grateful to Shindig because, as you can see, Shindig makes available the technology we're using right now. So if you're new to the technology or if you haven't used it for a while, let me just quickly show you how to participate. Where I am right now and where this slide is just for a minute is called the stage. This is where our guest will be, and this is where you can be too. We call it the stage because it's the metaphor of a stage in an auditorium. Everybody can see and hear everything that goes on the stage. Now, if you look right below us in the bottom half of the screen, you'll see a whole bunch of different people who are logged in with you. Uh, for example, my group, I can see Stephen Crawford, I can see uh, Bonnie Powers and a bunch of other folks. And that's the roughly 20 or so people who've logged in around the same time you did. It forms a kind of room and you can chat with them. In fact, if you want to have a private chat with one of them, you can just double click on their icon. If they want to talk with you, your two icons will snap together like Legos. You can have your own private audio visual bubble. If you don't like the people logged in with you, if you want to jump into other rooms and see who else is there, on either side of the screen, you should see a pair of chevrons. You can click those and hop between rooms. Now, I said this is all about conversation. So far, I'm talking to you and showing you slides. You may say, Brian, how do we actually converse? Let me show you the powerful ways. Look in the bottom of the screen. You'll see a white strip running along it with a few different buttons on it. On the leftmost edge, you'll see a number. And that's the number of people involved in this conversation. And right now it's 89. If you click on that, up will pop a couple of windows, one of which is a chat box. And you can say hello to everybody here. So we can see uh, hello from uh, Wellesley College, Massachusetts. Hello from Columbia, South Carolina, Salem, Mass, Los Angeles, Central Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia uh, area, Honolulu, Buffalo, New York, all kinds of folks. The chat box is a great place to share informal thoughts and references to things that come up. It's a pretty useful tool. But next to it, along that white strip, are the two powerful tools. You'll see one of them is a question mark, and one of them is a raised hand. The question mark is a Q&A box. Press that, up pops a box into which you can type your question. And when the time is right, I'll flash that question on the screen so everyone can see it, and I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. And people love using that. That's just a really reliable tool. And next to it is that hands up button. Press that button, and that tells us that you want to join us up in stage. 
So the time is right. I'll press another button and you'll be here right next to me and our guest. You can have a face to face conversation. So that question mark and that raised hand are the main ways you can participate. If that's not enough, if you're on Twitter, just use the hashtag FTTE and you'll find a bunch of people there tweeting into us. If they can't make it to the program, we're tweeting out from within the program. Uh, we already have uh, Laura Gibbs uh, asking a couple of questions right now. So just use the hashtag FTTE or tweet right at me, uh, Brian Alexander. Those are the main ways you can participate. And we're really grateful to Shindig for making the technology available for us to use. We're also grateful to our supporters on Patreon. Uh, Patreon is a crowdfunding site, which lets you collaboratively fund a project. In this case, it's our project of exploring the future of higher education. So some people contribute as little as a dollar a month just for us to keep the lights on and the machines running. And those in this slide here contribute $10 or more a month. And we're really grateful to them for all of their support. And you can join them. Just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. All right. Now, all of that. Whoa, I have a sideways picture. I don't know how that happens, so we'll have to bring her up on stage the right way. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome this week's guest. Um, we have a very, very important topic, and we have a very, very important activist in that area. Uh, Lee scalera Pissette is here to talk to us about the role of academic staff. So who are academic staff, you might ask? Depends on where you are. But Lee has a new column inside higher ed talking about this. She says, quote, staff is a fuzzy term in academe. It can include janitorial and cafeteria workers, groundskeepers, administrative assistants, IT experts, academic advisors, student services staffers, faculty developers, HR specialists, and more. Staff tend to be the most diverse labor sector of any college or university, both in terms of what we do and who we are. And we have Lee here today to talk about that with all of you. What happened to academic staff during this past year of crisis, and where might they be headed? Let me welcome Lee Scaler Pissette, my colleague at Georgetown University. And Lee's also brought your dog, Ziggy. Hello, yeah. puppy. Here's Ziggy. All right. He's here. He's in his little old man sweater, too. Well, I'm very, very glad to see him. I'm glad he's warm. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, there's part Chihuahua, and the Chihuahuas get cold all the time. Yeah, they're, they're not designed for this. No, you're not designed for that. Even with your little bit of terrier in you. Can we make so, a Bernie Sanders meme with Ziggy? Can you yeah. Hear? Well, I was going to say, it's a definitely an old, it's a it's a Bernie sweater, I'll tell you that. <laughs> very, very nice. Very nice. Lee, thank you so much for coming. You know, I, I have so many ways to introduce you, so many uh, stories about you I could tell. But the way, <laughs> the way I'd like you to introduce yourself um, is if you could tell people what you're going to be working on for the next year. So you know, for the rest of 2021, what's going to be taking up most of your time and most of your mind? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, well, I'm Professionally, I'm a uh, my day job. I'm a learning design specialist at uh, Georgetown University for the Center of New Designs in Learning and Scholarship, also known as CANDLES. I always have to try to remember what the acronym is because nobody actually remembers what it stands for. We just use CANDLES. Um, and so I work at the intersection of technology and pedagogy. And uh, 2021 so far looks a lot like how 2020 ended, which is mm. a lot of time supporting faculty uh, who are teaching remotely or in uh, a handful of hybrid courses where you know some students are in the classroom and some students are still participating remotely. So that has been my life. Uh, for now almost a year. So it started, we were actually a little ahead of it and saw it coming. And so since um, end of February, actually, um, we had um, Georgetown, it sounds, of course, really fancy because it's Georgetown. Uh, they have a villa in Italy where um, we have study abroad students. And so it hit Italy first and infected our students and faculty there. And they were all sent home and there were classes that needed to be done. And so we were asked to step in and assist with that. And then it became increasingly clear that the same thing was going to happen soon uh, here in the U.S. And so we were um, put, in a, put in an overdrive, um, so to speak. And so that's been, that's been our lives for the past, uh, you know, almost a year, as I said. And at least going forward to through spring 2021, that's what it's going to be like. And who knows what the summer is going to bring. 
um, in terms of what we're going to be preparing for for the fall. I think that that's one of the hardest things right now for us in terms of um, faculty support and pedagogical support is just the unknowns. And I think that's the same for all staff. We don't know. We don't know what we're preparing for. Mm. Um, you know, we usually have things planned out a year in advance, eight months in advance. We have a, um, a typical cycle that we follow through much like faculty do. And right now we just don't know, right? Um, there's no real opportunities to plan for the fall um, or what we're going to do over the summer, because it's like, are we going to be in person? Are we still going to be remote? Like what's going to DC going to shut down? Um, which also makes it a little bit more complicated for us as well, because we're Georgetown is in the district of Columbia in Washington, DC. And so we are also beholden to what's going on in the Capitol, uh, which can also get, as you know, as we all know right now, very complicated and complex. Um, so that's that's what my work life is is uh, a lot of and um on the side i write about staff issues i write about affective labor uh, mm -hmm. i write about online teaching and learning um so i'm going to keep doing that hopefully there's a book coming out that i edited on affective labor and staff roles uh coming out from Can kansas uh was hoped to be out by now but of course covid put all the peer reviewers <laughs> in uh in their burnout spaces so the cycle is going uh, a little bit slower but we're we're excited and hoping that it'll come out this year well i'm really looking forward to it please let us know uh so we can show. if you'd like to read some of lee's writing by the way and she's written a lot and it's great stuff both for chronicle of higher ed inside higher ed as well as on twitter and her blog on um, the bottom of the screen the left edge you should see a kind of I'm not sure what color that is. It's a kind of yellow tan mustard color, I think. But you'll see that as a, as a button. You can just press that and I'll take you to our homepage, which has a bunch of her writing and links to more still. Um, by the way, in the chat box, uh, Sarah San Gregorio just, uh, just chimed in with a yes, saying uncertainty for faculty sports folks is so hard. Um, and I may need to uh, 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 check in some time with you because my summer uh, gaming seminar, I'm still trying to figure out how that's going to play out. <laughs> if you forget a bad, bad pun. Uh, friends of us do, but yes, you know where to find me. <laughs> I do. If, if you're new to the forum, 95% um, of the questions and comments come from all of you. Uh, the floor is open for you to ask questions. So again, remember on the bottom of the screen along that white strip, there's that raised hand button. If you want to join us up here next to uh, uh, Lee, myself, and of course, Ziggy. Um, but if you'd rather just type in a question, just go to that question mark button and, and type in one. Uh, I, I have one to ask for you uh, in particular. Um, uh, but before I can do that, people are fast. This is great. Uh, we <laughs> have a question from David Houle, who came in here early from National University just to ask you this question. So let me bring it up. Nice. And then the role of faculty support. How will Candles, I think, uh, work to help empower faculty to address the issue of radicalization and extremism? Oh, Maybe that's an excellent question. Um, so we actually have a number of programs already in place at Candles. So we have the um, Engelhart Fellowship, which is uh, about diversity and inclusion in the classrooms. And so we have forums and spaces and speakers who have long been coming to Candles. This is a long established endowed program uh, who are who come in to talk about these things. We're actually Candles with the um, MCEF, which I don't even remember what it stands for at the moment. We're actually having a forum uh, this afternoon, uh, this evening, where we're bringing in specialists, uh, Georgetown on-campus specialists about uh, riots and political violence who are going to come and uh, talk to the faculty about the events that happened in DC um, and these sorts of um, uh, and this sorts of extremism. So we have long been we're a really interesting shop, so to speak, because we combine both the academic technology side and the traditional faculty development work um, together in one unit. So we do online learning, we do academic technology, and we do traditional faculty development as we typically understand it. And so we're particularly well placed to be able to offer the kind of programming and workshops and teaching circles, discussion groups that address those kinds of issues, how to talk about them in the classroom, um, how to talk about it with your students um, and, and those kinds of, of things. We're trying to, we're a domain school. And so one of the other things with that we are trying to build as well is 
um, digital fluency uh, using the domains program. And so we're hoping to launch uh, a program for faculty on being able to incorporate that into their teaching uh, as a faculty cohort for fall 2021. Yes, that's what they, this, that's what September is, right? Fall 2021. <laughs> So far, let me just yeah. just to jump in. Uh, Lee's referring to the domain of one's own movement. Um, early on in 2016, we hosted one of its founders, um, uh, the uh, awesome uh, uh, Reverend Jim, um, and um, Lee is a great hero of mine on Georgetown's campus because she powers so much of those. That's having students make their own domain and stuff it full of good digital things, and her class is excellent. Um, David, thank you for that excellent question. Um, yeah. uh, let's, let's keep an eye on that. We have more questions piling in, though, so I want to make sure they get uh, a chance to come up. We have the long-term uh, participant, Eric Mystery, who asks, um, what can staff do to make changes, especially in governance structure, where they have little officially sanctioned power of voice? He's particularly thinking of advocating for basic tech literacy. Well, that's that's a um, shared governance is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I truly believe in shared governance, but I think that there should be ways to empower staff to have more of a say in that shared governance. And um, you know, I most fa most campuses have a sort of staff forum or staff session, but very rarely does it have to do with the actual governance of the university. Usually, it is about very specific staff employee issues and not larger academic or structural issues. So I think one of the things that that needs to happen is we need to rethink the the um, the the concept of shared governance and to be more inclusive with the shared governance and have staff representation in these meetings. Um, now, how to go about doing that? Uh, it, it depends on your institution, right? Public versus private. Um, you know, large R1 versus regional versus community colleges, um, all the, uh, any university that I've been to, they always seem to have slightly different governance structures, even on the faculty side. Um, and if, whether or not you're in a unionized environment or not, um, or you're even able to unionize. So there's lots of these factors, these really complex factors that come into, come into to play. What I would love to see is more collaboration, working together with the, the administration, working together with both the faculty governance side and also the staff, I don't, it's, wouldn't even say governance, but whatever the staff representation group is mm -hmm. on your campus, I would love to see them collaborate more. I would love to see them get together a lot more in the same room and have conversations about these things. Um, if you are, if you do know um, the person who is the chair or coordinator or, you know, whatever the official title is of the person who is the head of the staff committee, I would reach out to them, um, get in touch with them, see what they're doing, see what mechanisms are available to you and to them, um, get involved with it. Uh, usually that's elected position um, and usually not a lot of people run for them. So you know, run for these positions, get involved in there and uh, and advocate, um, you know, learn as much as you can about the structure and governance of your institution um, and then see where pressure can be applied um, to get these kinds of changes. Who are your friends on campus? Who are the people who, will who are willing to work with you on the issues that are important to you as staff? Um, because you won't be the only one who's concerned about these things. And that's the other challenge of being staff is often we're very, very siloed, right? Even more so than the faculty where, you know, we, we at candles, we tend to work with candles and we work with faculty. So we work a little bit with IT, right? On the academic technology side and support side. But I don't work with anybody from student services. I don't work with anyone from, uh, you know, financial affairs or the student employment office or any of these other places where we may share these same concerns around, let's say, digital fluency, right? Um, but, you know, where are the opportunities to, for us to work together towards that end to get together to pool our resources to move things along institutionally? Right. So, you know, go out there and, and find out who your friends are and find out where the other things. And again, it's another thing to do. It's hard to do in the pandemic. It's not like we don't all have enough work to do. But those are the ways that that we're going to need to make changes is getting more staff together, getting more staff together with faculty and being able to apply pressure to the administration for things to change. Well, that's really well said. 
That's really well said. Thank you for the great question. Yeah. And Lou, that was a, a, a small seminar of an answer. Thank you. Uh, Victor uh, Villegas, and Victor, forgive me if I mispronounced that, uh, adds, uh, it's about networking and you need to be proactive. Uh, Amanda Burgess, Burbage, excuse me, says, in, in my experience, staff view themselves as vulnerable too, so it's a risk to speak out. Allies are important. Uh, Christine Moore adds, stemming from principles of academic freedom, there are yawning divides between staff being able to be recognized as full participants. Um, this is a, a great, great topic. It's clearly struck a nerve. And we have some follow-up questions that I, I, I want to bring up. Uh, let's see, this is one from uh, our awesome friend, Vanessa Vale, coming to us from the American Southwest. And Vanessa asks, how would you compare affective labor to what the National Nurses United refers to as care work? Uh, for what it's worth, NNU includes teachers as well as tutors, aides, and assistants as care workers. So I think that there are intersections uh, between that. I mean, affective labor comes from you know emotional labor and the managed heart. Um, uh, Horst Child's uh, really famous book on it, and uh, she studied flight attendants, right? And the idea of managing your own emotions in order to instill an emotion in the person that you're dealing with, right? And so it's very much about emotional control. There is care work that goes into that, definitely. Part of my job as a faculty developer is care work with faculty. And even, um, you know, as you move up the ranks, care work with administrators. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and so there is care work involved in that um, for sure. And there's intersections, but there's... Um, and I've always argued this and people get very uncomfortable when I say it, but uh, I'm going to say there's a certain intimacy that needs to be developed in order to have a productive, um, you know, collaboration with a faculty member. What we're doing is um, extremely intimate. We're asking them to examine their teaching practices, to examine their pedagogy, to make themselves vulnerable by yeah. asking for help to yeah. make themselves vulnerable, particularly on the academic technology side, uh -huh. to try new things, to take risks um, that could fail spectacularly. Um, and so there's a lot of intimacy in that. And there's a lot of emotional and affective labor that goes into it. And there, it is a degree of care work. Um, and it's complicated care work because, as people pointed out in the comments, there is a asymmetrical power dynamic, right, between faculty and staff, um, where we are, you know, that the faculty often view themselves as above staff. The then, you know, if you go by institutional hierarchy and academic hierarchy, that's the case. Um, and so that there's that particular amount of affective labor and care work that goes into it is how do I maneuver these complicated relationship structures and systems in place in order to have a productive relationship with this faculty member in order to improve their teaching. Um, so all of that is rolled into this work. Um, you know, uh, student services staff, much more care work probably. I mean, I don't know if you, you read it, but Chronicle did a piece called Team No Sleep hashtag team no sleep, focusing on the stresses that student services professionals are facing right now, given the pandemic. Okay. Yes. And it's a lot of care work, right? It's a lot of caring for these students um, and being the support mechanism and the infrastructure in place to help these students, not just you know succeed in college, but sometimes just survive, right? That's a lot of care work yeah. um, that is going. So there's definitely, definitely intersections in that. And I think in a lot of cases, um, we're saying the same things using slightly different language based on our audience for that language. I don't know if in academia, care work would be as accepted a term for academics where affective labor, they're like, oh yeah, affective labor, I get that. So I think it's, it's a, it's, uh, there are intersections, there's definitely things that are different about it, but it's also semantics and knowing who your audience is. Oh, that's a great answer. And, and Vanessa, as always, uh, a very, very deep uh, probing question. Thank you. Uh, speaking of questions, we have a whole bunch coming in right now, which is fantastic. Um, and hello to those who have just come in. Uh, I'm glad to see all of you, like uh, Greta Jenkins, Rick Rio, Ryan McDivitt, Michael Fried, George Station, uh, Clarissa, Hi, George. and Roxanne. It's so good to see all of you. Uh, let me just bring these up. I'm trying to group them uh, so that they, uh, they fit certain themes. Um, uh, one of them comes from uh, Mathieu uh, Plourde at Université Laval, 
So we get our, our Quebec angle for you. Um, Salut. <laughs> when, will Salut, we, Mathieu. when will we hit the tipping point where enough faculty will have had enough digital skills to change the convo from click here to turn on the audio to how to enhance the student learning experience? Um, it depends on your institutional culture, I think. Um, previously, I was at, uh, before going to Georgetown, I was at the University of Mary Washington, which was the home and the, uh, you know, where Jib Groom used to work and founded with Marta Burtis and Tim and all of those wonderful people at DTLT who founded Domain of One Zone and instituted Domain of One Zone. And before that, they had done the UMW blogs. It was the first multi-site for education using WordPress for that reason. Um, at UMW. And so culturally at UMW, they were already ahead of the curve, right? They were going through that transformation um, before that. They, in fact, uh, incorporated digital fluency into their uh, strategic plan. And now it's completely incorporated into the curriculum as one of the gen ed requirements that students have to take digitally fluent courses, which also means that the faculty, you know, and the faculty, I was, I was already at Georgetown, but um, faculty didn't balk at all. Faculty were like, yes, this is important and we should totally do that. Um, and so the faculty were ready um, and, and asking questions. Are there still click here to turn it on? Always. Right, but there was a plurality of faculty who were like, "No, we know technology can be used to enhance learning, um, and we want to start really working at it and doing it." But it was embedded in the culture that took twenty years. Um, not to not to sound pessimistic, but it was probably in the early two thousand fifteen years. It was in the early two thousands that they started doing the blog multi site, okay. and it was twenty. 15 that they put out the new strategic plan and it was 2019 maybe 2018 when um they created the new gen ed requirement for digital fluency so i don't know um there's a tremendous opportunity what i was saying about um covid is that uh, at least it, at our institution, and I, I've heard this from colleagues all over the place, suddenly people who never come to the Teaching and Learning Center, people who have never used technology before, um, suddenly are coming in um, and uh, seeking our help. I think we saw, what was it, 85% of our faculty um, and teaching staff, including adjuncts, um, came through and did our summer summer series of training institutes. We went, ran weekly training institutes. That's unprecedented. Right. The teaching and learning centers, you're hoping to get a handful of faculty who self-select every year. And it's usually the same handful. We got a tremendous amount of new people that we are uh, that we were able to level up. Right. To go from zero to maybe not where we want them to be. Certainly a lot further along than they were. And so it's how do we seize on this momentum and change the conversation on our campus through these kinds of structures um, to be able to to get from. Um, you know, how do I turn this on to, um, you know, yes, we really want to do digital experimental learning and digital fluency and all those kinds of things. And I think if looking at the model of UMW and how they did it um, is really, really instructive. I think that actually um, ties in really nicely with a question from um, our long-term ally, friend, um, and source of good information about technology, puns, and government, Tom Haynes. Um, hello, Tom from the Blue Room. How are you doing? All right. I'm wearing my camo today. I can um, tell you're completely camouflaged. You had a great question about the pandemic year in various modes, and I think that just chimes yeah. in perfectly with what Lee was just talking about. Yeah. So, what I'm um, one of the things that I have been uh, playing with in my head a lot lately is that you know, I you know, in my own mind this somehow this dichotomy between online and in person needs to go away and that you know we need to worry about uh, a spectrum of tools available to us as teachers and just use whatever is most appropriate to do the job that's at hand and not to be box dropped into arbitrary boxes as this is an online class and thou shalt do it this way this is an in-person class and thou shalt do it this way um and I'm wondering uh, what your impression is as to how much we've eroded those walls uh, over the last year and or going forward in the future, what potential there is for that. Because I'm really interested in 
trying to slide that. I mean, I think the future is hybrid. I don't, I mean, yeah. Yeah. whatever that means. I mean, the reality is if you teach face to face without any sort of online component whatsoever, there's something very broken there. Uh, and that was very obvious when everybody had to go online. I don't think we're going back to that. So technically that's already hybrid, you know, so, but I'm just wondering where you see that as going and having gone at, George, at Georgetown or more generally. Um, again, I'm going to say it depends. For Georgetown, I'm really optimistic, um, at least in terms of embracing more, more, more in different modalities, rethinking pedagogy, rethinking on how they incorporate technology. I don't know how many faculty, and again, these are self-selecting faculty who come to Candles events and all of that, saying like, I did this because of the pandemic and because of remote learning, and I'm gonna keep doing it once we go back to the face-to-face -face classroom. I am never doing X and Y again. I'm gonna keep using mini lectures to use asynchronously or um, smaller breakout, you know, breakout rooms and breakout groups. I'm gonna use Jamboard and Google Docs more. I'm going to do all of these things. Our institution is unique as well that um, it like culturally that it was, it's it's been, it was decided uh, you know, that there would not be any online courses for traditional undergraduate students during the regular academic year. Now, this isn't to say we don't offer summer online courses. And of course, we have a whole slate of online courses for the School of Continuing Studies, graduate programs, certificate programs. I don't know if that's going to change, right? This is, that's mm -hmm. a deeply culturally entrenched aspect of the Georgetown experience of whatever your campus may be and, and what that experience looks like. Now, I do see a more openness to digital tools, digital technologies, rethinking pedagogy, rethinking delivery in a more hybrid mode. Um, but I don't know if it will ever change where, yes, let's do a, a heck of a lot more online courses. Um, other places, I think it was already starting to happen. And I think suddenly you, get a, you have a lot more faculty who are on board with it rather than just seeing it as... Um, a pain in the butt, something that they had to do or something that they do to, to earn a little bit more money, but something that is now integral to the mission of the university. I think there's also people, um, I think one of the other things is that um, uh, faculty in particular are being really faced with the inequities that our students are, that mm -hmm. our students experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that doing online and hybrid isn't, it isn't enough just to have the will to do it. Uh, there has to be the infrastructure in, in place to support the students. Um, so I think that that is one of the bigger hurdles to overcome because I think we've all leveled up as faculty and as uh, institutions, but our students haven't necessarily leveled up in terms right. of their access to the proper technology, to the uh, enough bandwidth, to any of that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I used to work in rural Eastern Kentucky and you know, you left, you left the town, the, the town that the college was in, you couldn't get high speed internet access. And that's still the case. I don't even know how these students are doing it right now. Um, right. You know, uh, but you have your camera yeah. on and make sure you come to your Zoom meeting and stay for the whole three hours. Like it's, you know, if it, it, it's, it's confronting the limitations of technology. Um, it's confronting our own limitations on how we view online learning or remote learning or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that, and, and it's also changed our view, I think of our students. Um, mm -hmm. Some of us were more aware than others, um, but I think there is more an awareness. And I think all of that stuff has to come together in a conversation that institutions are gonna have to have because we can't go back to the status quo. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, we can't keep doing what we're doing either because, is, because it is so inequitable. And, right. and, and you know, honestly, I'm surprised hearing that. I, I, the little truth in advertising. I did my grad school at Georgetown, and, oh, cool. and I taught. I and both of my master's degrees are from there, and I taught my. I taught as a TA, you know, in, in Georgetown, and I now teach at a community college. And uh, um, you know, the difference in infrastructure. I mean, of course, I'm thinking in the 1990s, but. You know, Georgetown was actually one of the first places where I seriously encountered the internet, uh, and uh, you know, using Pine and Links. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, coming hearing in 2020 from you that, or you know, 2021 now, uh, from you that Georgetown students are struggling with technology ramp up is really kind of surprising to me and, and a little bit troubling because if you guys are having problems. I know what my students are facing, and I and I and I started with that assumption, and I 
personally think one of the big reasons that community colleges have been hit particularly hard by the enrollment drops has been because of that technology question at the student end. And I think we're making a huge mistake administratively in, in colleges that serve more diverse populations in not really pushing the, we'll help you no matter what. You know, we'll make sure you have Wi-Fi. We'll make sure you have a laptop or something that's a usable technology device to get you through this class. Because I think a lot of my students are like, I'm not doing this because I don't have yep. the things, the, 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 you know, the other things aside, just getting past that basic step. But yeah, okay, that's an interesting thought. I mean, I'm I'm really always very much into systemic things. I know Brian and I and our friend Ruben talk about systems all the time. Uh, and this idea that the systems may start to shift a little bit toward a more fluid environment for uh, different kind of modalities when it comes to uh, technology um, and is is intriguing to me. And I'm I'm just curious how often how widespread that is. That's a bigger question, Brian. We might want to ask the larger community as well, not just. It is. It is. Yeah. I, I want. I want to thank you, Tom, for the for the questions. And um... so, just just to say that I um I did a panel at the Modern Languages Association where we were talking about the remote and online learning with colleagues of mine who are both uh you know literary scholars and in these various positions. And mm -hmm. one of them, you know, one of my colleagues who teaches at a small pr private liberal arts college, very small private liberal arts college, he was completely mm -hmm. cynical about it. He's like, as soon as we're back in the classroom, all of these faculty are telling me they're just going back to the way things were. Um, you know, so I think it really depends on, again, institutional culture um in, in that sort of sense uh it, in terms of just how they're going to do it so you know unfortunately i no, no that's not a great answer but i think there is there there will be shifts and i think the universities that thrive post pandemic are the ones who are most able to make that shift um, mm -hmm. um and you know but then again there might be the outliers that parents are going to send their kids to because it's mm -hmm. it's back to high touch low technology right right and that's what they're that's what they're looking for for their kids and you know, it's the great thing about the U.S. Well, hopefully still great thing about the U.S. higher education system is the diversity of it. Right. Right. But I think technology allows us to push a lot of the, the cruft off to the side, the logistics and all that stuff and a lot of the content off to the side so that, you know, you may only be spending 20 percent of your time with the students. But that's a very intense focus, 20 percent where you're worried about their needs, their concerns, they're helping them as opposed to, yeah, you need to watch my lecture, you need to do my, you know, listen to me lecture on this subject. I've got that recorded. You can watch that anytime, right? So, you know, I just feel like there's huge advantages that to this that that we, uh, that I'm seeing. I'm just wondering if anybody else is seeing them. One more so. piece to that comes from the chat. Uh, uh, Mathieu Plourd, uh notices that faculty might want to come back, but students may demand something different. Yeah. Tom, thank Oh, you. yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. But we got to get past this this thing that, you know, you were asking about online cheaper tuition and stuff that online is somehow inferior. Mm -hmm. That's a silly question in a way, because it's how it's what you do with the tool. Online can be incredibly superior if you do it right uh, to in person. There's a lot of things I can do online that I can't do in person. Well, let's right? I can have Brian come to my class. <laughs> well, that might not be superior, but uh, but Tom, thank you. We have, we have a lot yeah. of questions yeah. coming. Yeah. Thank you. I've stopped monopolizing the stage. You're thank great. you. Thank you. And uh, again, thank you for the uh, for the answers. And of course, those of you who are cat fans can see one of my cats desperately climbing me because she always wants to be on screen. Um, we had a question that came in from uh, Sarah San Gregorio, um, and I'll put this on the screen here. She asks. So many faculty support people are stuck on an island of their own in a team of three or four or one. Do you have any specific tips for these types of folks who had a lot even before the pandemic? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, find allies on campus. Um, who else is doing the work? Who else is being approached to do the work? Are there opportunities to collaborate with IT, with the library, with, um, you know, we, we, uh, we have a, a whole unit uh, with for classroom technology. Again, I did like it's hard because Georgetown. I know Georgetown is an out, an outlier. I mean, we got an office for everything. We have people for everything, and even then, we're all still overworked and exhausted. Um, but it was really uh, it was really heartening to see when we made this shift 
that unit. So to give an example, we have a classroom educational technology services unit, and their job is to take care of the technology in the classrooms. Well, we didn't have classrooms anymore. So what did they do? They said, you know what? If the classrooms are now in Zoom, we're going to do Zoom support, right? And so anytime faculty have trouble with Zoom, they can come directly to us and we will troubleshoot. If they want to test things in Zoom, we will test things in Zoom with them. You know, did people still come to us with Zoom questions? You bet they did. Um, but there was another resource on campus that they said, we'll take, we can take care of this. And so it's finding those people on campus who are already doing some of the stuff and just saying, hey, is there a way we can collaborate to, to make all of our lives a little bit more, a little bit easier? Also, just getting to be able to talk to different people, that's really nice and helpful and supportive. Um, but the other thing, and this is, this is complicated and this is hard, um, depending on your position within the institution, sure. sometimes we have to say no, right? We do not have the capacity to do this. Can we do something else instead? Um, you know, we, this, we have to, and, and this is complicated to say it. I'm in a privileged position to say it. And a lot of you will probably say, nope, can't do that with my administration. And I totally get that. But to know your own capacity, to know your team's capacity, um, and to be able to, to push back, hopefully with some data and just say, this is not, um, you know, this is not feasible right? We can't do this. Um, here's what we can do, but we can't do this. Um, and, you know, let the administration know just how bad it is, um, you know, and hope that makes a difference. Now, again, I don't know if it will or if you could even do that, but, you know, we've got to, we've got to be better. We're so used to being in a um, deficit mindset, within higher education, where we're all scratching and clawing for our little piece of the limited pie. And it's even worse in some ways during the pandemic, because all of our budgets are just being clawed back to nothing, right? Furloughs and hiring freezes and even, you know, loss of staff, because staff are easier to fire than faculty are. Um, but we still need to think about um, how we respond to these requests and how we make clear to our administrators the work that we're actually doing in our capacity. Um, because at a certain point, you just have to say, look, if if you're going to burn us out, you're not going to have a teaching center anymore because we are we can't do it. Um, so being able to, to make those cases and make those arguments, it's not just I'm saying no, but here's our capacity. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we can manage. Sarah, thank you for the for the question. And Lee, I love the I love where you took that, where you took the the labor theme and really really deepened it. Uh, we have a, a bunch more questions, and I'm I'm afraid we might not be able to get to all of them uh, before. I talk a lot. I apologize. Well, <laughs> why you're here, and and we're absolutely delighted to hear it. Uh, so some of these might be uh, easier to wrangle. Uh, I'm going to try and clump them together as as best we can. This is from Kate Montgomery at SMU, who asks. Do you see an increase in staff taking on adjunct or contingent faculty assignments? Have you seen a trend towards an increase in those types of roles? Um, I haven't, uh, to be honest. We're, if anything, uh, staff are saying no to these kinds of things where they would typically adjunct, but now it's just like, I don't have the capacity to do that right now. Um, I haven't seen it. I honestly haven't seen it increase. Now that might vary by institution, but certainly in my institution and in my circles that I'm in, that hasn't been that hasn't been a trend that I've seen. Okay, good question. Interesting question. Something to keep an eye out for. Yeah. Um, and we had a, another question here. It comes from Mark Corbett Wilson. Hello, Mark. Where does the curve of the decline of enrollment in institutional survival intersect with that 15-year technology learning curve Lee just described? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully before the <laughs> before it closes. Wow. Uh, and I, I think it really depends on the institution. I mean, some institutions, and we've seen it, you've been tracking it, Brian, and I always tag you when I see one. Um, there are institutions that were right before that were right on the brink before the pandemic happened, and the pandemic happened, and it just sent them over, right? Yeah. There was just no way. Yeah for them to survive this. They, they couldn't financially do it. Um, 
there are some places that don't see the curve and will keep on keeping on the way things were as soon as the pandemic is over and, you know, and just stubbornly go forward and hope. And then there'll be the places that have the will, but also the funding and support, particularly if they're public institutions, to be able to, to get up onto that curve. Thank you. That's a, it's a good question, uh, Mark. And thank you for that. And Lee, thank you for the, of course, the very good answer. Uh, Rachel Barlow uh, over at Wesleyan, uh, who's an Associate Director of Assessment there, has a really good question too. What have you observed about how the relationship between academic staff and faculty slash admins has changed in the past 10 years? Uh, and I think by admins, she means senior admins. Yeah. Um, I think the pandemic has changed it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it has made visible the amount of work that we do to support students and faculty. Um, you know, I think that, and then this is it's maybe a gross exaggeration, but I, you know, I have a lot of friends who are faculty and very often faculty don't think of the larger infrastructure of the university that supports everything that they do, right? They might know the granting office because that's where they get their money from and have to go through them. Um, but very rarely did they have a good understanding of student services mm -hmm. that are available on campus and those kinds of things. So I think we're, there's an increased awareness um, I have not seen the culture shift yet. I'm hoping that there is one, um, but I haven't seen it yet. Well, this is we're, fascinating. Still, we're still part of the problem, well, or were. It, it seems like we're, we're talking in part about this fast moving crisis, it's barely a year old, but at the same time we're dealing with some long term uh, trend lines. Tobin uh, has a great question about this, but first, uh, Sally Muriamu has this really important observation that just connects with right what you're saying right now. Our teaching and learning center is 100% funded by a fee that students pay for courses that are called online. Students are unhappy. There's a false dichotomy between remote and online, which is a really interesting observation, Sally. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, more questions are coming in. And friends, you saw with Tom before, that's how we do video questions. So if you'd like to uh, do what Tom did, you don't have to wear blue necessarily, um, but you can come in, just press that raised hand button and and, and we'll be happy to bring you up. Um, so uh, one question um, that has come up here uh, has to do with uh, the digital divide. And I'm glad to hear this. Christine Moore from Phoenix College asks, what about our staff who are part of the digital divide? And the fear, concern, the basis of their work has been in-person service to students. I think that there's a. I think that there are there are always going to be things that are that that face to face is preferable to online. Um, but what we're seeing increasingly is that uh, you know uh, mo uh, most of the faculty that I've talked to, just to give an example, will be like, "I'll do in-person office hours, but you can rest assured I'm going to do Zoom office hours too." Still, because the Zoom office hours have been way more popular than their in-person office hours ever were. Um, so I think that there are uh, there are opportunities for consultations that happen remotely um for some of that work to happen remotely um but you know everyone once this is over i think is going to be craving to be able to go someplace to talk to someone mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um that's our biggest frustration everybody's like chat bots are the answer and i'm like oh well mm, everybody wants somebody to 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 go to and talk to um at the end of the day so i think that you know I, I think there still is a, a faculty staff, uh, sorry, a staff divide in terms of the digital um, readiness. Um, but I think that, again, a lot of us have had to level up and figure out how to do our jobs remotely. And hopefully we can take what we've learned and incorporate that into our daily practices once things are back to somewhat normal and say, okay, well, how can I do this better? How can we do this better? That's a, that's a great question to unite everybody, I think. Um, just a, a reference back to a previous question. Michael Tassio says he's been blessed to hire underemployed adjuncts into staff roles supporting remote instruction. So they're able to support their knowledge and be able to build out their team, their time of need. So that's fascinating, Michael. If, if you have anything more you can share on that, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear it. 
Um, friends, we're down to the last nine minutes, so I want to make sure that we get to hit all the great high points, and you are all a fountain of really good, thoughtful questions. Um, so I want to make sure that we get to uh, um, get to address as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, this is uh, from our awesome Roxanne, uh, who asks, what do you see instructional designers and learning experience designers as more significant and necessary now beyond course redesign facilitated by the pandemic? Well, I think um, I'm gonna go by uh, what, so the the acronym for faculty developers, the acronym for the Institute, the, the National Organization for Faculty Developers is actually the Professional Organizational and Development Group, so POD. And we're really great on the development part. We're not so great at the organizational part, not because we don't have the skills, but because the infrastructure doesn't exist to include us in the organizational changes. And I think that's where learning experience designers, instructional designers, academic technologists can play a huge role going forward. That if we're doing, if we're reimagining the university and how we deliver education, I don't like saying deliver education, but how we educate, there we go, how we educate our students and engage our students, then I think we should, we need to play a crucial role in that design process. Bringing our years of experience, our expertise, our skill sets um, into that conversation, because I think that it would be, it would be tragic not to, right? Then you end up in the situation where, um, and I write about this a lot, where I want us to be active in the process, not just the people responsible for delivering it. So when they come in with the vision and say, okay, now make it happen. And you had zero input in it and you look at it after the fact and go, this doesn't make any sense. Like I can do this, but I already know it's not going to work. Right. Um, so that's where I see our expertise, hopefully being able to be used and harnessed is in this massive conversation that um, is going to be taking place around how do we best serve students? How do we best educate students? which is a great direction for the conversation to go in. But right now I want to yank that conversation sideways because we have a question that goes back to another one of your many abilities, Lee. Uh, and this came from Julie Severs. Uh, and she asked, she's curious about the process of pitching your writing series to the Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, especially because the Chronicle's focus seems to be on faculty. So how did you do that? How did you manage to get the Chronicle to publish your writing about staff? Um, that's a, I, so um, I don't know if you know uh, David M. Perry, uh, Ella Lollardfish, is that mm -hmm. his Twitter handle? Anyways, he's, he's quite, uh, he's wrote for the Chronicle for a while and actually wrote a piece um, probably about a year ago now. I don't know, time has no meaning anymore. I don't know, was it last year, three years ago? I have no idea about um, bullying of staff. Um, and, you know, I, of course, take to Twitter and I'm like ranting and raving about staff issues uh, and, you know, or retweeted and getting the conversations on Twitter about these things. And, and he reached out to me and said, well, you know, they're looking for someone to write about staff issues more at the Chronicle. I could put you in touch with my editor there. And he's like, I just don't have the, the, the capacity to do it. And you, I think you'd be good at it. And I said, oh, okay. Um, so he put me in touch and um, the editor said, all right, well, send me something. Um, so I sent her something and she, well, then the pandemic happened. And so I sent stuff about online learning <laughs> uh, and remote teaching um, and then said, well, I think it's a good time to start talking about staff issues. And she's like, yep, send me the stuff. And so I sent it and she said, nope, this is great. I think it'll be really good. And I said, okay. Um, so I've, I've been really lucky, like all the way back to my days at writing at Inside Higher Ed and having a blog there, mm -hmm. is that I've had people who have advocated for me and who have um, introduced me to the editors and believed in my writing to be able to say, you should have a larger platform here, let me help amplify you. And, um, you know, so it's, it's I've, and, and I also don't get, <laughs> I don't get worked up about these things. I think I'm pretty chill about the whole thing where it's just like, eh, it's Chronicle, you know, which helps uh, where I just hit. It's like, that's ah, good enough. Let me send it and see what happens. Um, so it's, it's, it took a long time. I've been doing this since 2010. Now I'm, I just passed year 10 of writing on the internet. Um, so it's, it's been a lot of practice too. 
That's a that's a great, very, very practical answer. Uh, Rachel, thank you for sharing the uh, uh, link to the piece about bullying. Um, George Station notes in, in the chat that this shows the continuing importance of the personal learning network. Uh, and that's, that's definitely there. Um, yeah, social media might be evil, um, but I, I can't quit Twitter. Uh, that's my whole network. That's my professional learning network. That's those are, you know, I wouldn't be where I was if it weren't for the people on Twitter. And so it's, it's kind of hard to if you, if you tell me where everyone on Twitter is going to go, I'll go there. But so far, there hasn't been one. So I'm staying in Twitter. I hear that. Uh, uh, it was Kate Montgomery who asked the question about staff um, adjuncts before. So, Kate, I wanted to thank you. And that was the response back to that. Uh, coming back to another earlier point of yours, I just want to make sure that we don't lose. Lee, you're speaking so eloquently before about uh, affective labor. Uh, and Jeff Rosedale, who's library director of Manhattanville College, asks this. To the extent that it's appropriate or inevitable that staff will be asked to do more effective work during the COVID pandemic, how can staff be trained and or prepared to navigate that successfully? That's a really great question. Um, that is the uh, uh, million dollar question. I think that one of the first steps is to recognize that it is labor and that it is skilled labor that uh -huh. requires training. Um, and and recognition, right? I think the first step is really to to acknowledge it, um, to name it. That was one of the things I, I wrote about affective labor and COVID nineteen for Educause. That one's free too. Um, I wrote about two two pieces for Educause for that, and um, you know the response was overwhelming because people were writing me and tweeting me and saying, "Finally, I have a name for it. Finally, I understand why I'm so exhausted." Um, you know, finally, all of these things. And so I think a lot of people just didn't understand what was happening. I don't think our administration really has gotten their heads around that. Um, and so that's the kind of first step, because once you acknowledge it as something, then you can start develop programming around it, right? Workshops, um, support, uh, support groups, for lack of a better word, we give teaching circles to support mm -hmm. teachers and their pedagogy. Why don't we have the same thing where we have staff members together talking about their affective labor and how we handle these situations? Mm -hmm. You know, we're 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 good at developing faculty. We're not necessarily as good at developing ourselves sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so to create the space, mm -hmm. which is hard to do in a pandemic, obviously, because we no one has any time for it. But how do we create the space for these conversations to happen, to happen productively, and then figure out what it is that the staff needs, right? Because staff needs will differ by unit, um, by institution type. Um, you know, I imagine staff have a much different need at a place like Georgetown than they would at Moorhead State, uh, where I used to work, right? Because it's a much different student um, population. And so, okay, well, what is it that we need? Well, that's a great question to ask here right at the at the very end as we uh, start to come almost completely over the edge of the hour. Um, we're good at developing faculty, not so great at developing ourselves. Um, that's quite an observation. We, we had a, a bunch of questions that had to do more with teaching um, and uh, pedagogy, and but I want to make sure we didn't get the... Ah, there was one more staff question here, and this is from... Uh, 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 Charles Findlay uh, at Northeastern who asks, how can the university provide upscaling faculty and the technology in their own disciplines, not just embracing technology for teaching and learning? Um, I think it's, uh, it's uh, modeling, right? It's finding the faculty who are doing it because there are faculty who are doing it. And sometimes they're doing it in almost secret, um, particularly in the before times where um, particularly early, uh, early career faculty who are worried about senior professors viewing their teaching as radical and therefore voting against for tenure or making that problematic. So in a lot of cases, you know, you would find one or two, almost every department who are doing great things, but didn't talk about it. We're totally low key about it because of the institutional culture um, yeah. that existed. So, you know, find the people who are doing it at your institution because they're there um, and give them opportunities to share their experience and their expertise with their colleagues create and, and value it. Right. If the university says they value it, their colleagues are going to come around to it. But if the university doesn't value it, there's no way the disciplines are ever going to value it either. Um, you know, almost everyone has 
Almost every discipline also has some journals specialized in teaching and learning. Um, but again, we typically view scholarship in the teaching and learning as less than scholarship versus hard research within the discipline. Um, you know, that's a whole other a whole other change that needs to take place within the disciplines is valuing, be it with technology or not, valuing research on teaching and learning um, and experimentation and growth in this area. But, you know, the disciplines and the institutional always don't value that. And so, of course, they're not going to. So you're fighting an uphill battle where it's like, you know, I want you guys to get, get passionate about teaching. And they're like, well, here are my tenure requirements. Mm -hmm. Teaching is somewhere down here. And I also know that the that my department is not a huge fan of these things. So where's my motivation to do this, right? And so those are the kinds of things that I think about when we think about cultural changes is that they want to hear from their peers. Um, they want to hear from um, comparable institution types, people mm -hmm. with comparable mm -hmm. institution types. Yeah. Um, but you also have to change in a lot of cases, unfortunately, disciplinary and institutional culture that has long devalued teaching. Mm. But we are here definitely to value the academic staff. And we found that with your help today, Lee, and learned a great deal. Um, thank you so much. We're, we're just past the end of the hour, so I have to wrap things up. Um, we now know from your confession that the best way to keep up with you is both through your Chronicle columns as well as through your Twitter feed. Is that the best way to keep up with you? Yeah. So if you follow me, Ready Writing, R E A D Y W R I T I N G, um, the, and uh, Brian tags me, has been tagging me for all of the promotions for this. So you'll find me there too if you find Brian. Um, everything I do, I share on Twitter, uh, literally. Um, so it's a bit much, but I certainly share the links to all of my writings when I appear on podcasts. Um, you know, anything that I do, I've typically shared, I overshare on Twitter. Um, so that is the best place. And my blog as well, uh, readywriting.org. And there's a link to that down the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. We thank you so much. Thank you for all You're your welcome. Thank you so much for this opportunity. A pleasure. And thank care. you all for coming and your wonderful questions. Um, it's really, I love this. It, it, it pushes my thinking, especially during the pandemic when you don't get to talk to a lot of people. And so you get all stuck up in your head in a lot of cases. And this is an opportunity to, to really push my thinking and to, to challenge me. And I really appreciate that. Oh, great. Glad to. Please give Ziggy a hug from us. Oh, he's still on my lap. I'm surprised you can't hear him softly snoring there. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. But don't go everybody else. On that wonderful note of, of snugliness and warmth, um, thank you all for all of your comments uh, today. Let me just point out a couple of things before we go. One is that for the next uh, five weeks, we've got a whole series of great sessions. Again, just go to tinyurl.com slash forum 2021 to see those. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these issues about academic staff, uh, we have all kinds of venues on social media, uh, including uh, LinkedIn and Facebook, as well as Twitter. And if you'd like to go back into the past and look at our previous discussions on everything from domain of one's own to adjunct faculty, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And if you'd like to learn more about our forum, uh, about our reports, check out these two links, especially if you want to learn more about Shindig. In the meantime, let me thank you all again for your great thoughts, your great discussion today. It's been a pleasure talking with all of you. Um, this is still a crazy time. Please take care of yourselves, stay safe, and I'll see you all online. Bye-bye.